What's up, guys? It's Andrew Velasquez with another episode of Mindful Artist Podcast. And that song you just heard is my song called Mi Corazon, written by myself and produced by Aaron McLendon. You can download Mi Corazon wherever you stream your favorite music, Spotify, iTunes, YouTube, all the things. And I want to ask you a favor. If you are a big fan of this podcast, as I know that you're working on yourselves because you're super creative and spiritual, I really want to encourage you to go to our reviews, leave us some stars, tell, tell a friend about us. And if you're a fellow creative person that is also entrepreneur and balancing your spirituality, email me at mindfulartistpodcast at gmail.com. And for today, another episode, your one-stop shop for all things balancing creativity while being spiritual and an entrepreneur. I have another amazing special guest, you guys. I was doing the math. And I mean, if you're watching already, you see how beautiful he is right there, right? Look at that handsome face. <laughs> But literally, we've known each other since like we were baby twinks, our t- our twenties. And oh wait, I wasn't the twink. You were the twink. I was the okay. twink. First of all, you were like <laughs> maybe a little cubby. I don't know, but you're still yeah. You're cute. You're cute. And so, who is this guy? Who is this person that I'm talking to? You guys, give it up for Pavi. Yes, welcome, Pavi. Let me give you a little hey, bio, Pavi. Thank you for being here. Oh my God. Okay, so. You guys, Pavi began his career in makeup where his work graced publications such as Allure Magazine, People, Marie Mary Claire, Cosmopolitan, just to name a few. He also was a part of many, many fashion shows for LA Fashion Week as well as New York Fashion Week with prestige brands as Laura Mercier and Nars Cosmetics. During his time doing makeup, he has incorporated hairstyling on some editorial shoots over the years. But in 2010, he shifted to do hair primarily. (laughs) He had the opportunity to be a part of the entertainment industry as a hairstylist, where his work as a key and department head can be seen on features such as Snatch, Dicks, The Musical, Self-Reliance, and notable TV shows Dave, Love, Victor, and Westworld, in which he won a Primetime Emmy Award. Wow, that's amazing. Pavi celebrity clients include Dave Beard, I'm probably butchering that last name. Michael <laughs> Samino, Brad Pitt, Anthony Hopkins, Tessa Thompson, Isla Fisher, Johnson, Julia Fox, Andy Samberg, Anson Mount, Noah Centino, Billy Lord, among others. You guys, I mean, come on. That bio speaks for itself. Bravo, my friend. Thank I you. mean, I have looked up to your portfolio for such a long time. You've been a really great friend and mentor in the past whenever I had, you know, questions about the industry and being a part of an agency or local 706 all the things and i'm just so proud of you you've come such a long way you're you're an emmy award winner like wow like i want to know all the things and this is why you're a perfect guest for this um let's go a little bit back in time and talk about where's poppy from where did you grow up give us a little bit of the origins yeah all right well um (laughs) all right i'll give you the cliff notes i mean i'm from orange county originally you know, I was um, pretty much grew up in uh, Costa Mesa. And uh, for anyone who's from Orange County, they know how conservative it was. And when I was mm-hmm. growing up there, it was like the 90s. And uh, something that uh, you and I have in common, obviously, is our love for Madonna. Yes. And <laughs> clearly, yes. if you if you know Andrew, you know he is a Madonna fan. She's right fan. there. She's yeah, right there. Like, <laughs> She's there and she's in a few other places that you yeah. can't see, but I saw yeah. that. <laughs> yes, I love that you know. But um, I mentioned that because she was someone who was very instrumental in just helping me uh, kind of push the envelope and be myself. And, you know, I came out when I was 14 years old and I was probably one of the only, you know, out gay people in high school besides a couple other people. Um, but I was like in ninth grade and, you know, like I said, it's Orange County. It was conservative. It was not that accepting. I was, you know, some people have told me over the years, like they, that I inspired them to come out that uh, because of them, I felt they felt comfortable to be who they were. And, you know, I always was pushing boundaries with like uh, doing stuff with like my hair, uh, doing things with my makeup, wearing barrettes, doing glitter. I mean, it was the time of raves. It was the time yes. of... Um, you know, party crews, Mm -hmm. like I had a greaser look for a second, I would do like, you know, like a candy kid thing. I would do club kid makeup and hair to school. Like I really was out there. But, um, you know, my first love was actually, um, my first first love was fashion. I for a long time, I wanted to get into fashion design. 
Um, and I would like make Barbie clothing, you know, for my Barbies when I was a kid. <laughs> yes, so I was that, that gay. I had the, the Barbies. Mm-hmm. I had the Cabbage Patch and uh, the He-Mans, but I would turn them into drag queens too. <laughs> ooh, ooh. <laughs> you would use the yarn from the Cabbage Patch to like, yes. make a, a, a wig for He-Man. 100%. Well, yes. yes. And the Rainbow um, Bright Sprites. I love those too. Oh, yes. Mm-hmm. yes. I had a red butler and like the green one because every time I would go to look for Rainbow Bright, she was sold out. <laughs> I still have my and, blue it, one. and it was the only one in like the bargain bin was Red Butler. Like that was yes. the only one. Um, but yeah, so just play with dolls kind of got me into fashion. And then when I was in high school, like, you know, junior, senior year, I started to look through magazines and really get inspired by, you know, the 90s supermodel. I mean, uh, recently that show came out on uh, Apple TV about the supermodels. Mm-hmm. Like that was so my good. area. That was like my era, our era of growing up, like, They were the first influencers. They really were. And it was like, they were everything. And so I would look at these fashion magazines and see, you know, Linda Evangelista is a great example that Mm, she would be in different campaigns and you would see like all these different looks on her. And I was like, you know, I almost wouldn't recognize her in some things. And then I realized like, oh, it's the makeup and the hair that she looks different, but you can still kind of see her. And I was just so um, entranced with that. So I immediately started getting to makeup. Um, one of my first jobs, which a lot of people say, don't tell people you did that, but I'm sorry, I'm actually proud of it. Um, I worked Whoa, what is it? What? <gasps> Glamour yes. shots. Glamour yeah, shots are so, awesome. I mean, listen, for me, it was a really good opportunity, especially looking back, knowing what I know now, I got to see what makeup looked like on camera. I got to see, you know, balance of hair on on camera because when you work at Glamour Shots, it wasn't just like, you know, I'm gonna go and play with makeup. Like you had to do hair, you had to do makeup. Um, at the time, I really didn't know how to do hair. Like I had never really used hot tools. Um, as the first place that I learned how to use hot uh, hot rollers, um, and I had a couple um, stylists there kind of teach me how to use an iron. And then that totally changed the way I started doing hair. But um, Thermal of it nonetheless, all. I was still really like into makeup. That was like my love. I was all about the transformation. Um, I also began doing drag around that time. Like in high school, I started doing drag. So little or- side, side origin of that. You Work. Know. Um, so I did drag. Uh, so obviously I was playing with my face and doing all kinds of things. Wait, wait, um, you have to know what was your drag name. Oh. And did well, you have a drag mom? You know, I technically didn't really have a drag mom, but what my, my drag name was Miss Fiction. Mm-hmm. So Miss Fiction was <laughs> a, like a quick side story about Miss Fiction. So I was going to Oz at the time, like 18 years old. It was the the gay club in Orange that County. That place like, was amazing. Gay, yes. That's where you went. Like, you were like, when you went there, you were somebody. And they had 18 and over. And, like, you know, sometimes you get there and they could sneak you into the 21 and over side. Um, I won't say who those people were. Uh-huh. I don't want to get them in trouble. Like, it matters anymore. The club is no longer there. But for me, it was Arena. That secret. Oh, Arena. Oh, Arena, too. That was like, mm-hmm. that was the playground to have like your club kid fantasies. And like yes. your house music fantasies and like oh. dance. Friday nights was all ages and you so could dance good. till like four in the morning. It's like so New York. Mm-hmm. Um, but I went to the show at Oz and, you know, I had gone dressed in drag a couple times and I went and I was watching the show and I'm like, oh, I could, you know, there was like queens like uh, Tiffany Diamond and Brittany Halston and Paulina or Pauline. You mm-hmm. remember Pauline? Mm-hmm. She did Selena. She was a Selena person mm-hmm. for the most part. And the host was Tommy Rose. And Tommy Rose, um, actually now she's uh, a, I think she's a cast member in Lacage over here in LA. It's like a really nice. big deal for her. I just noticed she's doing that. But anyways, um, so she was the host. And I remember going to her after the show saying, you know, me being this 18 year old fierce, you know, my nickname was Diva Bitch. So that can give you an <laughs> Very indication fitting. on who fitting. I was back then. With the capital um, T. Everybody knew about Diva Bitch. <laughs> Um, so I went backstage and uh, I said, you know, I want to perform. And she's like, well, okay, you know, we have a spot in two weeks. You can perform. Um, what's your drag name? And I said, Diva Bitch. 
And she like scoffed at me. She's like, ah, honey, you have oh. to earn the name Diva. Ooh. You're going to have to come up with another name. And I'm like, oh, shit. You got schooled. <laughs> I got schooled. And I remember like I was getting my performance ready. And I was talking late one night with one of my friends. And, uh, you know, Mac was a very popular brand at the time. Like it was, that was when Mac was in its like prime, prime time. Mm -hmm. Like it was the best formulas, the best color selection, everybody was using it. It was affordable, but not cheap. It, it was also like the go-to drag queen look, makeup, yeah. product Oh, yeah. 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 I mean, studio, you were like, if you were a gay boy, if you were a drag queen, you had studio fix on your mm -hmm. face. Like, Probably too down. much, too lighter than your skin tone, but yeah, that's what we would Yeah, <laughs> that was the look. That, that was, was the was filter. The 90s. <laughs> it was the 90s. But I remember I was on, on the phone late one night with um, a friend of mine, I was trying to think of drag things because I'm like, I can't, you know, use Diva Bench. And she's like, huh. Ah. And, and a, a calendar just came out. Uh, they, they were featuring like different colors each month for Mac. And I, I was, I happened to have one I was flipping through and she was looking at it. She's like, what about uh, fiction? I'm like, fiction. And at the time. I did not know things. this story. Yes. Because that's how this I fiction love it. Be because, you know, Miss was like, you know, at the time there was Lady Miss Keir, there was um, uh, Miss Lady Bunny, there was, uh, oh God, Misunderstood. Mm -hmm. And and Misunderstood <laughs> was like the kind of club kid drag queen, like comedy queen, I guess the kids would say now. But I loved how her name was like one word, Misunderstood. And I'm like, yeah. Miss Fiction. So it's not like Miss or Mrs. It's Miss Fiction, like one Very word. Very Madonna. Mm -hmm. yeah and i'm like this is this is who i am i'm miss fiction you know it's like kind of the balance between what's real and what's what's fake you know choose your illusion and that's who i am like i'm just going to give you what you don't know you need yet but you're going to be glad you got mm -hmm. it so love that. anyways that was like a detour so it's drag, okay yeah. no we're here for the detours <laughs> yeah so I, I did that and um uh and I worked at Glamour Shots, so I got a little bit of um, experience behind the camera, like learning about makeup and hair. And I was like a, a supervisor there. And then I started working at uh, the makeup counter. So one of the first makeup lines I worked for was um, Hard Candy, which I don't think they exist anymore. Correct me if I'm wrong. I'm not I don't sure. Know. I can look it up really I, quick while you're talking. Yeah, but... But they were like really big. They came out with their nail polishes and they had um, like the best shadows, like very pigmented. They were doing silvers. They were doing glitter. They were doing bright colors. And um, so I got hooked up to uh, freelance. They're for still them on online. There's a hard oh, they are? Mm -hmm. Oh, wow. Oh, wow. Yeah. That's that's really good to know. Well, kids, go check out uh, hard candy. <laughs> get, the, get the techno shadow. That, that's like the best shadow quad ever in life, if they have it. Um, so, I, so I started um, freelancing in the counters. So I would go representing this brand, selling the products to the people. And then I uh, got a position at Bloomingdale's in Fashion Island as the mm. shift super, or not shift supervisor, excuse me. I was um, the counter manager for New Trends. Now, New Trends consisted of uh, hard candy, uh, Girlactic, um, Two Faced when first Two Faced first started, and uh, Urban Decay. So those were like my brands that I was in charge of. So really cool all brands. The, all the glitter, all the shimmer, mm -hmm. all the fun, all the grunge, all the glamour. You know, so I was with them for a little bit. Uh, then I upgraded and I got. Um, pulled over to NARS when NARS came to Bloomingdale's and Fashion Island. So I was the counter manager there for uh, like a couple of years. Um, and then I got uh, accosted to join Laura Mercier Cosmetics. So I got an interview and I became nice. a national artist with Laura Mercier. So that was, I, I that. first started as a regional and then I jumped up to a national artist. And then um, I did that for like two years. So uh, what was great about that just a, a note about that journey is like working with fun brands um, and then going to a brand like Laura Mercier, which it was very, I want to say she was slightly more regimented as mm -hmm. far as the technique on how to apply foundation. Sure. 
the tight line, how, how to make skin look like skin, but still flawless. Like the whole philosophy of the brand was really refined how I did makeup, honestly. And I'm very grateful for that because, you know, going from a brand like NARS where their slogan was, there are no rules with makeup to a brand like Laura Mercier with a lot of rules. <laughs> it was kind of hard to like break transition this wild stallion of a makeup artist to like kind of not go in a box, but just kind of like, you know, a shade around the box a little bit less, <laughs> yeah. you know? Um, but it, but it was a great experience. Um, and all the while, like I had done, you know, some fashion shows, like uh, I got to do some things in fashion week in LA. I got to do um, Nicole Miller in New York, uh, Pamela Rowland in New York for Laura Mercier. And I, you know, I got to travel around a lot. Like I've been to almost every, every state in our United States with Laura Mercier. I got to travel to London. That was pretty amazing. Um, and then 2008, uh, the uh, economy started to crash. In 2009, I unfortunately got laid off uh, and they laid off a, a number of artists. So I was kind of at a, at a place in my life where I didn't know exactly what I wanted to do. Because um, like I was going up this, this climb in my makeup career and I always had aspirations to be like Kevin Aquan. You know, I believe yeah. like I can be the next Kevin Aquan. I have skill. I, I'm, you know, I'm creative. Like I understand skin. I understand, I understand like the different skin types, ages, you know, textures. Um, because that's a thing that I would say, not to throw shade at people nowadays, um, you know, who come up with like Instagram and TikToks and YouTube, like, a lot of these people, they don't have the experience of working on a real people. They have experience of working on their face. So, you know, back when we began, you know, you had to get experience and learn what it was to deal with different textures and age groups, different shade tones. You know, not everybody's going to be a yellow with a gold highlight and, uh, you know, a, a taupey, you know, contour. Like, you need to understand... Right what works on the skin tones and uh, mm -hmm. undertones and all the stuff. Anyways, I digress. So you're good. I was at a point where um, I'm like, okay, what am I going to do? Uh, because I, I wasn't like really trying to freelance with a bunch of brands at the time. I did still freelance for Laura Mercier because um, my, my real good friend, Teresa still ran accounts for Sephora. So I would just go around and do events and stuff. But uh, I thought, okay, I'm going to go to school. Um, I'm going to go get my esthetician's license because I wanted to um, be a facialist or estheticians because I thought, okay, that's an easy transition. If I'm not doing makeup, I mm -hmm. could go work in a spa and do facials. Mm -hmm. And then I would have, you know, be able to make money and clients and blah, blah, all that. So that was my intention with going to school. However, um, when I joined, there wasn't anything available like with the classes for estheticians. So I'm like, okay, well, let me just take the hair classes. Like I had dabbled in hair. I had done hair for photo shoots. I liked doing hair, but it was not my passion at all whatsoever. So I just went through the whole program and through that, you know, two and a half years of going to school pretty much full time, you know, um, I really found a love for hairstyling. Um, you know, I really, it's like if if you're familiar with that movie uh beautiful mind you know the one with um what's his name the australian actor and jennifer connelly the one who was in um not 300 gladiator what's his name i'm looking it up well anyways that actor that that ozzy um he played this character that uh was a genius and he was a mathematical genius and like these equations, like you'd look at a board and these equations would pop up on the board and it would like solve the problem. Al almost actually another example is a queen's gambit. You know, when she's looking at the, her, um, her plays with the chess pieces on the ceiling. It's like the, all well, the anyways, pieces of the puzzle coming together. Yeah. It's in her head. So yeah. like, that's how it was for me when I started to learn the fundamentals and the basics of hair like everything I had been doing, I could look at a hair now, see the balance and the shape and say, and like, I can see like 
the hair is moving into place, the shape coming here, and if I tease it here, I put a pin here, and this, and that, bam, bam, bam. bam. Hey. It, you know, it, it just like, it clicked in my brain. Yeah. I'm like, oh. You had your aha moment. I had my aha moment, and I a lot of pieces of the puzzle just like, oh, that's how you do that. Now I feel like, okay, I could call myself a hairdresser. So I finished school. Um, and, oh, another cool thing that happened. So the, the, towards the end of school, there was a competition that I had entered um, that was kind of a big deal in, um, in uh, beauty colleges. It was called Junior Style Stars. Okay. So basically, it's a competition where you you pay money, you get a mannequin head, everybody gets the same mannequin head, same hair, same everything. You have to cut color, style, and do makeup on this mannequin head. Um, so I did this competition. There was about 300 people who entered, and the first prize was 50,000 cash and prizes. So nice. it was a pretty big, pretty big deal. Especially and, for back then. Oh my God, yeah. And I was just like, you know, I was like kind of struggling. Like I was on unemployment, like I wasn't working full time. I was, you know, living with a roommate. I was freelancing on the weekends, like in between school. So it was, it was a tough time for me. Um, so I did this competition and, you know, every week, like it would dwindle down top, you know, top 100, top 75, 50, blah, blah, blah. Get down to the top 10. Um, at this time I had taken the exam. I passed my exam. I got my license. The school had called me. They're like, oh, you know, we want to do this thing where we're honoring students um, who had graduated. And sure enough, they show up. Me and this other girl who happened to be in the competition uh, showed up. And they had this, like, little luncheon thing. They uh, presented us certificates. And then they're like, oh, you know, we want you to come to the, to the, um, to the uh, salon, you know, to say hi to the, the students and, you know, talk about whatever. I'm like, okay. So we go and they have a curtain up. I'm like, something's fishy. So we were hmm. pulling up there. And at this time we knew that both me and this other girl were in the top 10. And and mind you, this was a competition that the the rival school, LA Tread Tech, they had been taking this trophy like every year. That's actually where so, I went for fashion merchandising. <laughs> oh, really? Oh, how funny. Yeah. <laughs> so they, they had been taking the, the, the prize for this competition and I was at the time going to Santa Monica College, which, listen, if you're thinking of getting into cosmetology, go there. And I tell this to everybody, go there or a junior college because right. you can get grants, especially if you're a minority. Uh, you can look for grants. Um, get the education to pass the state board. Don't worry about going to a fancy school. If you know shit about hair, shit about, you know, estheticians, all that. Go there and learn it, get your license, and then go take specialty classes with, you know, the other, the other brands. I'm not going to name names, but there's some that have schools, very prestigious schools. But I am a firm believer that you learn the fundamentals, learn how to pass the board, so you have the basic skill, and you're not being indoctrinated into a um, a philosophy of a brand. It's like more even playing field, and then you see what you even like in hair and makeup, you know? Then you look up who's the specialty, who, who's the ones who are specialty in hair cutting? Who's the ones who have specialty in color? Go to the, then go to those brands and, and get educated on them. If they have a school, go take classes. But that's my little soapbox on that. And I, um, um, let me give a little oh, add to what you were saying really quick. Oh, sure. This is exactly why I wanted to create the safe space as well, because there are so many students of mine and my past that are listening to this for exactly what you're describing right now that kind of like uh firsthand experience and expertise and, and advice really as, as a mentor mm -hmm. um and yeah i think you said it perfectly I, I relate to your story so much because uh i also was infatuated with donna and and kevin okwan and yeah i mean who doesn't want to idolize and be like the person that they look up to as a hero in their industry and also like the makeup, the love for makeup first, for me as like an artist, as a, going to LA art school first and the hair thing, going to cosmetology was like an after of like, oh, and, and yeah, you, mm -hmm. you, I related to so many things that you said, because it's, it is all relative. Um, and you have to have that like one switch that clicks it for you. And then mm -hmm. for me, it was doing hair color because color theory, when we do 
color correction is relative to the same we, when we do hair coloring. It's all the same color mm -hmm. science. So I yep. always tell my students is uh, exactly what you're saying is like, try everything, learn the fundamentals first, because you're not going to figure out your strengths in those couple of years as you're learning. You're going to learn from your discoveries and your your challenges and your opportunities, but really it's mm -hmm. out in the floor, it's out in the field, it's out in the, in retail cosmetics, or it's out yeah. in assisting where you kind of have to fuck up to, and you're going to, like, that's just yeah. bottom line. That's how you, when you ride a bike, when you're learning how to roller skate, you're going to fall. Yeah. That's how you yeah. have to learn Absolutely. so you can get back up and keep going. So thank you for sharing that. I just wanted to piggyback on your advice. And I think that's really smart. Oh yeah, of course. And uh, you know, it's like, it, it, it's important to, I, I find it so important to share that with people. And, you know, I've done a couple talks with um, schools and, you know, students and, you know, form where like it's there, we're there to share and I'm there to share my experience. And I'm very open to share that because it, it's, you got to find out what it is that drives your passion. And if you are out there trying to be like, if you're doing hair, makeup, or anything in the beauty industry that is, you want to be a, uh, like a celebrity, this or that, that's just who you work on. It's not who you are. Like, like I would say, you know, speaking of makeup, like, Yes, I've worked on celebrities, but a smoky eye is what I'm an expert at. I want you to, you know, talk to me about being a smoky eye expert, not, a, you know, a celebrity, this or that. It's not important to me. I think right. for other people, it is an important thing. And, you know, power to you, boo. I mean, if that's what you want to do, that's what you want to be. Be that, do that, um, you know, be an artist if you want. But if it's like, a, what's your priority, you know? Think think about it a little bit thoroughly yeah. and what, what your passion is and what you want to do. For also, me, what's I like do... what's feeding your soul? What's feeding your soul and mm -hmm. making you feel those butterflies and gives you joy? Yeah. You know what I mean? With the power of your hands. Like it's gotta be something that's gonna be impactful. You can't just do mm -hmm. something mediocre because you feel like it's gonna get you likes or uh the yeah. celebrity of it. Like you you like you said, you wanna put your passion into it and make sure that you love it and you're happy with it, you know? Yeah, I, I, that's the the bottom line is you got to be happy with it and and do it for the right the right thing that is good to your soul because celebrity fades, you know talent is forever, even if it starts to dwindle away because you're physically ain't able to do some certain, certain things, you know I I personally would rather be known for, you know what I did, not who I did. That's just my my hey. thing. Um, but wise, wise words, my friend, wise words. <laughs> yeah. So, oh, wait. So, um, back to that story I was telling. So, long story short, we go behind the curtain and they're there with a big ass check. Uh, and it has my name on it. So, I won the competition. Yay. Yes. So, that was just one, <laughs> one great accolade. And, you know, after I got out of school, I um, had an opportunity to work for, um, work on an independent thing. And I actually met um, uh, a really well-known makeup artist, and you probably know him because uh, he he did Madonna's makeup during the Drown World time. Uh, his name is Clexius Colby. Um, yes, I know his work. He, yes, he worked with Madonna. He's worked with Janet. He's worked with some of the greats. He's done Whitney, and he was working on this project, and we got along really great. And he's like, "Hey, I'm going to be doing this film," uh, and you know, I want to recommend you to do the hair. And I said, okay, yeah, I'd love to do it. You know, not even thinking like, oh, I want to get into TV and film. You know, I want to be a hairstylist. I still very much was, I'm going to be the next Kevin Aquan. That's right. where my head was. Right. And so I did this film and lo and behold, like the film flipped. Now, the thing about working in the union uh, when you do things, it's not the easiest process to get in. Uh, one of the, the things is you have to do like 30 days or 60 days within 60 months under two years. Like there's this whole mathematical equation in which you have to accrue your hours and your time to count towards being a union member or being eligible to join the union. Now, 
like that. It was not for me. Uh, I did this film and we were on it. It started non-union and then it turned union and I was on it for 30 days. So I got into the union. Dang, so it was amazing. a blessing. It was a total blessing. And at the time I'm like, well, I don't know if I want to join the union because I still want to do makeup. Like that's my passion. But I did know a few people who kind of educated me on the fact that in the union, there are more hair or there are more makeup artists than there are hairstylists. So if you get an opportunity to go into the union, you should do it as a hairstylist, not a makeup artist, because you'll have more work. So knowing this knowledge, I thought, okay, well, I'm going to join the union. I'll do hair. I have a cosmetology license. It makes sense. You need one to be in the union. Um, so why not? So I did it. And, you know, that was like 20, 2010, 20, that was like 2011, I think. And, you know, six years later, fast forward, I'm on the set of Westworld as the key Incredible. stylist. So, it, you know, uh, the other point I want to make, and I, and I said this before in things I've spoken on, the things that I've done are attributed to my hard work, my passion, but not having an ego. And when I say that, I mean, when you get approached to do a photo shoot, to do it, you know, for trade, for free, for credit, whatever, if you don't have experience, do the shoot. I don't care right. how good you think you are. I don't care who you think you are. I don't care who you've worked on. If you don't have the experience, do the shoot because you don't know what that's going to lead to. If you have the time, if you have the kit, why not take that opportunity to exercise your muscles, whether it be your mental muscles, your eye muscles, your, your hand muscles, your creative muscles is what I'm getting at. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And it keeps you sharp. It um, connects you to people. And yes, it's like, okay, there are the people who utilize people who don't have experience to get what they want for their thing. But I met an actress on a shoot. It was a free shoot. I didn't get paid. She hired me on a short she was doing. From that short, I did a mini series. From that mini series, I met another actress. She got me on a, another short. That's where I met Clex. From that, I did the movie. From the movie, I got in the union. From the union, six years later, I got on a show. And guess what? I got an Emmy. And I still do free shoots. It. And, oh, wait. Let me be clear. I don't want a bunch of phone calls for free shoots now. <laughs> but I'm saying don't scoff at it don't put your nose up at it you do not know who you're going to meet you don't know who's who's heading where i worked on a set once where a pa just a pa doing lockups not even working on first team he was on a show doing pa and a year later he's directing a film that won a bunch of awards at a film festival we're cool we talk every now and again i know that if he has a film he'll he'll hit me up and say hey i have this thing we you know, we have a budget, you know, do you want to come and do hair on it? Like, you don't know where, what seeds, uh, what plants grow from these seeds that you plant. You Absolutely. Know? So just, I, I, you know, drop the ego. You know? Yeah. No, I, a couple of things. I love that you're saying that. And I just want to piggyback <clears> on what you're saying. Uh, just to reflect a little bit of your story, and your beautiful story, by the way, and I'm so proud of you. Um, I mean, number one, you're expressive and creative, right? And that's always what's mm -hmm. going to feed your soul. Um, number two, you took risks, like you took many risks to step out of your comfort zone and say, yeah, well, I'm really comfortable with this particular service, but I'm going to try something else. You also, uh, joined competition shows where you were put on a stage and a platform to test yourself in front of people. And again, stepping out of your comfort zone. So really my point is to express and encourage others, artists, especially to, to put yourself in situations like that. Cause if you're always in this, you know, comfortable zone, how are you going to expand? How are you going to mm -hmm. discover other parts of you that maybe you could evolve and grow into and, yeah. and maybe develop better habits, old routines that are not being of service for you anymore. You know what I mean? So that's mm -hmm. why I wanted to create this space to, 
So I, I knew that you were going to be perfect for that. Um, and well earned, like Thanks. pretty much like every year puzzle, <laughs> the way you express that, um, uh, the pieces of the chess coming together, that's been your career. Like all mm -hmm. these little pieces have led you up to winning the game, to winning the Emmy, to every nomination. Like you weren't chilling, you know what I mean? Like you no, were working all. your ass off to network, to do the free gig, to... But then, boom, it opens up other doors and avenues. So, Absolutely. yes, run, living your life with mind, body, soul. And that's kind of a perfect segue into um, my next part. What type of spiritualities do you practice or if you are spiritual at all? And mm -hmm. how does that help you balance your creativity as being an entrepreneur as well? Because that's what you are. You're an entrepreneur. Well, well thank you. Uh, yeah, I agree with all that you said. <laughs> Well, spirituality is a very, um, it's a very personal thing, isn't it? Like, you know, everybody mm -hmm, has mm -hmm. their, their um, thing in life that they look up to that is their guiding light, that is their God, that is their, you know, goddess, that is their deity, what have you. Um, I come from a family that isn't necessarily very religious or anything. But like my mom's side was Mormon. My dad's side was uh, traditionally brought up Catholic. But when he was growing up and like, you know, he traveled in the Navy and did all these things, he had done different studies and read up on other religions, uh, Hinduism. Also, Hinduism. I love the relationship that you and your dad have. Sorry. <laughs> oh, <laughs> I, you know, everybody who meets my dad, they love my dad so much. And I'm so grateful that I have my dad. I unfortunately lost my mom in 2007 to I'm cancer sorry for your loss. Yeah. um thank you thank you um i i know we we share you know that mm -hmm. part like mm -hmm. um they're still with but us but it's hard it, yeah it's it's hard when you don't have uh, a parent with you but um you know to have him in my life is a blessing and you know i would say that's a little you know when you think about it when you have a relationship with your parents or parents or, you know, your aunt, uncles, grandparents, what have you, the person who's raised you, um, it's almost a spiritual practice to connect with them and to learn from their experience Absolutely. and to be there to listen to them um, and to understand that time is futile and you don't always have the time. And, you know, that's something I feel like over the years, I've kind of realized how important it is to um, be present with, you know, those moments that I actually am able to have with my dad. Cause I don't know how many more years I'm going to have, if I'm being right. honest. I mean, right. he's, he's 82. He's going to be 82 this year. What's dad's he's, name? He's Paul. What's up, Paul? Yeah. Shout out to Paul. We love Paul. Yeah. Everybody, everybody knows him <laughs> as uncle Paul. You can follow him on Instagram. Let's uncle go. Paul. U N C L E P A U L. <laughs> um, but he's, he's a real, real cool dude. And everybody who meets him loves him. And he is just so full of life. And he has a lot of heart. And I feel like um, when I think about that question about spirituality, it's about love. It's about uh, self-discovery. It's, it's about centering your energy. Um, mm -hmm. I'm really big on... Now, I couldn't sit here and tell you all the mechanics of chakras and, you know, the different crystals and solar systems and, you know, uh, astrology or anything. But I will say that the bits I have read, read, um, read up on, I find relevance to my life with it. Um, it's helped me, it's helped guide me in how I interact with people. Like if I know someone's sign, <laughs> like... I've, mm -hmm. I've actually done it where if I know someone's sign, if they're in a certain position with me, um, it kind of forms the way I will uh, interact with them. Like the questions I'll ask, you know, there's some people where you meet them and you got to know they are always right. They're in charge. And even though you know something's incorrect, you have to find a way to show them the correct way, but make them feel like they came up with the idea. Make you know, them feel like, heard. Mm -hmm. Make them feel heard. And and at the end of the day, that's what it's about is everybody yeah. wants to be valued. They want to be heard. They want to be considered. Um, so like that's 
a little bit of, for me, what makes it important to just stay as grounded and connected as I can. I try to meditate when I have a moment. Good. Um, you know, really taking moments to pause, uh, to not react. Um, it's taken some time to uh, learn that. And, and I would say that, you know, when you're young, and not always when you're physically young in age, but you can be 50, 60 years old and be young. And by that, I mean immature. And immaturity isn't acting like a child. It's just not being evolved enough to understand what the situation is at hand, to be able to recognize it for what it is to stop and pause and think before you react to something. And, you know, I'm, I'm no and actually person. listen, like, right? <laughs> and listen, that's the biggest thing is listening because you can't understand the situation or speak on something unless you hear like with clarity. And even if you're not listening in the moment, just, you know, let, let the person go, let them speak, let them do what they got to do, take it in, sit on it for a minute and then react. You know, it's important. I, I feel that. like that's part of my spirituality is that's beautiful taking those moments and pausing and being being uh mellow as i can um because i can get worked up very easily um i'm a very passionate person not the diva bitch um, though oh she's still she's still up in here <laughs> she's in here with us we all swim down a little bit or yes what's that what's that thing from it from it we all swim what, what did they say when the when the bloom went in the drain well, anyways, whatever. Yeah. So yeah. Diva bitch is still. My point <laughs> is, is, she still is still very much alive inside of me, and so is Miss Fiction. Um, but Poppy is in control, you know. Mm -hmm. Um, and just kind of bringing it back to who's at the driver's seat, and and understanding uh, the difference to lead with your mind, uh, or your heart, or your emotion. Um, I will say that most of the time, leading with emotion isn't always the best key sometimes it is though because sometimes you have to get to an emotional state to break through someone who can't feel love mm -hmm. and when you when you have love within yourself you can share it with them in a way that they may not recognize and when they see that's what your intention is i think that's the most beautiful connection we make with each other is for them to realize it and you know, connect with you on that. And I think that love and, and human connection is like a, a ultimate spiritual connection, a, a spiritual experience, if you will. Absolutely. So, you said that perfectly. I guess perfectly that's what I would friend. say. Like, like if I, you know, I, I just, I just believe it. Like I go with the flow of life. I, I feel my way through things. I trust my instincts inside. Um, I listen. Um, and I decipher what works for my life and what will not and respectfully decline the things that don't work. And Setting healthy boundaries. Absolutely. Yeah. 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 And that's something that's, you know, it comes with time. It comes with maturity. And, you know, the sooner you come to a realization that you have to be open to it and, and like growth, what, like we mentioned earlier and what you were saying, you can't grow uh, unless you feel something and, when you feel something that doesn't feel good sometimes, it hurts, it's uncomfortable. But if you're feeling that feeling, then you're growing. So just go with it. Let it happen. You know? It's temporary. It's all temporary, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. You're so beautiful. I love you so much. I'm so grateful to have you still in my life. <laughs> yes, blink those beautiful <laughs> lashes. I, we got so much information, you guys. I hope you really took all of this and just soaked it up like a sponge. We're now going into one of my favorite parts of this podcast. It's called Wrapping Up Mindful Arts Podcast with Rapid Cues. So I'm going to ask you a few questions, Ooh. three in particular, just okay. right off the top of your head. Um, don't have to think about it too hard, but just okay. intuitively, what is the answer? Question number okay. one, Javi, who yeah. is your hero and why? Oh, my mother, because she was a survivor. She persevered and she was artistic and uh, she was passionate. What's mama's name? Julia Perrier, like oh. the water. Julia, shout out to Julia. We love you. Love that. Yes. Cool, cool. Okay. 
Question number two, what is your favorite music album of all time and why? <laughs> oh my God. Like, you let it play so from hard. track one to last track. You, oh you're, on a, you're on a deserted island and you only have a disc man with one CD. Ooh. Uh, it, uh, something by Bjork. Uh, yes, good choice. Homo homogenic. <gasps> homogenic. Because mm. there's a good range of ballads Chills. and Chills. dance music. Mm. Good and, choice. And I performed... I performed Pluto in drag, and it was one of my best drag performances ever. <laughs> yes, I love your drag performances. Uh, I miss them. I, I need we need to have a reunion with Miss Fiction soon. Oof, oof. Let's bring we'll see her about back. that. She's Let's she, bring her back. she's in a cave somewhere in the Ozarks. I don't know. She's we can like, find her. She's I'll dig her up. <laughs> okay. Well, good luck. <laughs> <laughs> okay, babe. All right, we have one more question for wrapping up my bars, rabbit cues, and that is, what is your favorite quote of all time? Mm. oh my god could be uh, someone that said to you or somewhere that you read it or a mentor oh told my you. gosh it's that um, one quote that's going to be on your grave you know what i mean oh my god that's so much pressure okay uh the only thing that's coming to my mind is a quote from uh an interview in a magazine i don't know which one and i'm probably going to get it incorrect um but basically, it's something to the effect of, um, I don't regret my decisions because they're the building blocks of who I am. And I believe it was from an interview with Madonna sometime in the 90s. But that's loosely what it was. So it sounds quote accurate. Me, me. It sounds accurate. Yeah. Yeah. Bravo. Yeah. Love it. That's a really <laughs> good quote. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much for sharing your love, your light, your energy, your story, your passion. I felt it. I'm like chills and goosebumps all over. I feel great. I hope everybody out there feels <laughs> the same way and is receiving all the energy that you're giving out. I'm so proud of you. Um, this is your time to plug. What, where can we find you? Where can we follow you and support your, oh. your craft? And what is the next thing you're working on? Any projects that are oh. coming up that yes. you can talk okay. about? Oh, yes, yes. Um, okay, well, you can find me on Instagram mostly. Uh, Pavi Artist is my handle. Uh, give me a follow. You can message me there. You can check out things I post. I don't post too, too often because I try to be strategic and post things three at a time because I do this thing with tiles and I sure. have to have it because I'm so anal retentive about shit. I have to have it even all the time. So I hate when it's like grr, 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 like that. Uh -uh, it doesn't work. I feel you. Anyways, it's your portfolio. So, it's your grid. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, probably uh, artist on Instagram. Um, that's pretty much my only handle. I do have a Facebook page, but I kind of keep that for friends. Um, but if you find me on there, uh, you know, Pavi Oliveris, Pavros Oliveris, um, it, if you want to be friends, I, I try to post different things there. So it's like more personal things. Um, those are my two main ones. Uh, and actually I just wrapped on Friday, a really freaking cool movie, uh, called Idiotka. And it is going to be it's it's kind of like the storyline it's a it's a comedy and it's loosely based on a um kind of a project runway experience Ooh. Um, yeah yeah so it's like you know this family this this girl she's talented she makes her way in this competition and it's like kind of a coming of becoming who she is and finding herself and shedding the shallow parts of what fashion are and it kind Love of poking that. fun at what fashion thinks it is yeah, and those shows of what they think they are. So it's it's gonna be really good. Uh, it's gonna Julia be your Fox next Emmy. It. Putting that out there. Well, no, not Emmy. It would be an Oscar because it's gonna be oh, a feature. Oh yes, Oscar. Yeah. I'm putting yeah, that so out we'll there. See, we'll see about that. I mean, I don't know. It could be. I mean, it was a very fun film. Uh, so that and then oh, actually, uh, I do have a movie coming out on January 12th um, called Ooh, right Self Reliance. Around the yeah, yeah, Self Reliance. Uh, it's the first time director uh jake johnson and you might know him from new girl he played uh uh zoe de chanel's boyfriend mm -hmm. i believe i didn't watch the show so i don't know but people who know jake johnson really know jake johnson uh he has a big fan base um but it's his directorial debut and uh yeah we did that film last year and i think That's it's so dope. Be great so everybody check it out on hulu january 12th Love, love, love. Congratulations, babe. I love you. I'm so happy for you. <laughs> yes. 
You guys, thank you so much for being here with us at Mindful Artist Podcast. My name is Andrew Velasquez. We have Pavi. Go out there, make an impact in someone's life. And that song you're about to hear is called Mi Corazón, written by myself, produced by Aaron McLendon, where you can download where you stream your favorite music. And follow us on Instagram at Mindful Artist Podcast. And if you're also a creative person that balances your life while being spiritual and an entrepreneur, email me at mindfulartistpodcast at gmail.com. Until the next time, you guys, much love and light to you all. I love you, Pavi. Bye, guys. I love you. <laughs> Au revoir. <laughs>